first thing that typically any digital photographer will find themselves uh, doing is uh, importing their images. You, I just went out, I took a bunch of images, and, um, and then it's uh, time to get them into some sort of a library manager if uh, that's you know your cup of tea. And so I grabbed a folder here, I took this uh, last year, and I'm gonna open it up so you can see here uh, what we have. Let's go into the icon view. All right, so I have all of these images over here and, and you can see them listed and um, I'll explain this the file naming convention in a second, but what this is, is this was an entire day shoot at an abandoned school um, on the border of, I think it was on the border of Massachusetts and New York, New York State. Um, and uh, it was just an awesome place because the school itself was closed down, uh, but we got access to it, pretty much unfettered access. Um, and so what I need to do now is go into Lightroom and import them. But let's start from scratch. Let's start from before that. Let's pretend that we are brand new to this. First thing we're going to want to do is create a catalog. So I'm going to open up Lightroom, which will probably go into an existing catalog right now. No, thank you. All right, so here's a catalog, but let's start a new one. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the file and then select new catalog. And what I'll do is I'm going to create a catalog on my desktop in a file, uh, a folder structure that I would use at home in my production environment. So this is how I do it. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is create a new folder here by clicking on new folder. And I'm going to call this um, Lightroom catalogs. So that's my master Lightroom catalogs folder. Under that, I'm going to create the year. So it's 2012. And under that, I'm going to create uh, one more folder called first half. So um, what I do is I create uh, catalogs twice a year uh, on January 1st and on July 1st. Um, I used to create them every quarter, but um, I, I found that to be unnecessary. I found that uh, uh, Lightroom's database technology was actually pretty good uh, for uh, you know managing large amounts of files. And so I'll just, once I have the folder structure, you could see it here, desktop, Lightroom catalogs, 2012, first half. I'll type that again, first half. So that's the name of my catalog. I'm going to hit create. Lightroom closes and then it reopens in that catalog. And you can see it's pretty much a blank slate. There's nothing in here. Um, I don't, I'm not going to spend too much time customizing the, the identity plate or anything like that. But if you want, you can go to the Lightroom menu item in Windows or on the Mac and go to Identity Plate Setup and then you know you can use a graphic or text or anything like that um, and you can change the font over here so um, of the uh, of the module selectors on the top right. Now it's time to actually import. So let's do this. Um, actually you know what here's I, I, there is a setting that I typically do like there are two settings with a new catalog let's backtrack for a second we create a new catalog if you go back to the Lightroom menu item and then select catalog settings there are two things I typically like to do and I was actually talking with Ryan about this just before we started the webinar the first thing I do is under the backup under the general tab under backup I'd select never um, if you want you can have Lightroom back up your catalogs uh, on a predetermined basis but I use a separate backup method. Um, uh, and so that's kind of a, uh, it, 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 if I were to use the Lightroom, the built-in Lightroom backups, um, it'd be redundant. So I turn that off. And the other thing that I do is under metadata, I turn on this checkbox that says automatically write changes to XMP. The XMP, uh, without going into too much detail, that's kind of the, that's the instructions file. That's the sidecar file that every raw image uh, has associated to it. And um, Lightroom works based on an XMP instruction. So every every slider that you adjust, uh, every change you make to your image, uh, whether it, assuming it's raw, it's not actually uh, making the changes to the raw file. It's making changes to the XMP. And so um, by checking this off, it's automatically right. Lightroom's automatically writing to that XMP file uh, as you do things. So for me, it's just a cleaner process. All right. Now, um, let's go ahead and uh, import. I'm going to go to File, Import Photos, and let's start the process here. So uh, new to Lightroom 3 uh, is this kind of import window. It, it wasn't the case in Lightroom 2, um, but I really like it. It took a bit to get, to get used to, but um, I've really come to like it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate uh, under 
uh, our account. Wait, where is it? Under users. No, wrong one. I need to find my thing. There we go. Users, uh, on one software, desktop, and there's our file, Urbex School. And so you can see right off the bat that we've got um, thumbnails listed. And, and nor normally would be the case, I, I'm going to have all of them selected. Sometimes if you know um, that there's certain images that are just garbage, like they were, there was no exposure, you, you can deselect them if that's something that uh, you care to do. But all I'm doing right now is I'm just scrolling through to show you. Um, these are, for the most part, uh, bracketed sequences for, for tone mapping. Um, and so this is a good example. This gives me a lot of opportunity to show you uh, once we import um, what you know what uh, I would do here to to um, keep things in order. So uh, the first thing I'll do here on the bottom is I have the sorting set to file name. I like to always sort by file name. That's just my own personal preference. And then let's drop down these two folders here or these two uh, tabs. Um, along the top, you've got four options. You've got copy as DNG, copy, move, and add. Copy as DNG will take any images that you send into Lightroom and convert them to Adobe's DNG file format. That's their digital negative file format. Um, you can do research uh, and make your own decision as to whether you're going to keep raw files or convert to DNG. I shoot in raw because um, I don't want any any, even though it's an uncompressed file format, I don't want any changes made to my original file. The raw file is exactly what was uh, put out by the camera, totally uncompressed, and that's kind of how I want it. Um, copy will actually take a copy of your image and put it to another location. Move will physically take those files and move them from one folder to another. And add will simply add the images into your library without moving them anywhere. And so for this purpose, I'm going to do add, but let me show you something. If I select copy or move or copy as DNG, you get a few other options. The one that I want to bring up here, let's close all the other ones out for a second. Um, uh, we'll keep these two. File naming is the one I want to keep up. And so when, um, whenever I uh, take images with my 5D Mark II, the default image structure or the file naming structure is IMG underscore 008. So if we bring up the thumbnails, you should be able to see that a little bit easier. You see. IMG underscore 0030. I like to have the date associated with it. Um, oh, and I just saw here Gordon asks if these are raw. Why do they say JPEG? I converted these to JPEG for the webinar, uh, Gordon. Normally, they would be raw. They'd be CR2 files. Um, but you'd only see the IMG underscore and then the uh, sequence number. I love seeing the date associated in the file name. And so for me personally, I turn this on to rename, and there's a tape template that automatically works for me. It's called date dash file name. I like that. I'm not going to use it here because it was already renamed, but I do like having that um, file name uh, done because I like seeing the date in the file name. It helps me um, know exactly uh, you know which folder I can find my images in. I'm just looking at some of the questions here uh, while we're going on. For me, Raymond, I use I use copy on my personal workflow with raw files because that'll take the raw images and just copy them. I don't do copy as DNG. And so um, on top of that, if you're doing copy, move, or copy as DNG, you'll also specify a destination. However, because we're doing add, there is no destination. The destination is the source, so we don't need to add them anywhere. Um, under file handling, Normally, I'll have my pre, uh, render preview set to standard. Um, basically, the options here will determine um, when, how you want your payout. Do you want your payout on import to be um, a faster import, or do you want your payout to be that the import will take longer, but you'll have your full resolution uh, previews uh, rendered in advance? Uh, standard, I find, is a nice kind of middle ground. One-to-one -one will mean that Lightroom will automatically render the full quality previews of every image as soon as it's done importing. I don't really need that right now. I'll do standard here. And I always have don't import suspected duplicates. So with that done, I'm going to hit import. And so you can see what's happening. Because we're adding, we're not doing anything else, it adds really quickly. And then also you can notice right here, it starts rendering the previews. 
Hey, Ryan, uh, any questions right now that you think are good to handle? That's a, it's a great question, and I find that uh, backup strategies are always, um, people love also hearing about backup strategies. And so uh, what we're going to do is at the end of the webinar, um, or at the end of this part of the, of the webinar, I'll go into my backup strategy. Um, no problem. I'll share, uh, you know, this kind of stuff, there's nothing proprietary really about photography. Um, it, it, it's, it, it, the whole point is to kind of share. Um, and so I'll share with you everything about how I work. Not a problem, uh, including my backup strategy. So I did say that I don't back up my catalogs, and I'll show you why. Um, so with that, um, let's go ahead here, and you can see I've got brackets. I've got brackets across images. So if I kind of go in here, we can see you know brackets of this image, and the, this is a perfect example of where tone, uh, HDR and tone mapping is important because you've got very very bright sunlight coming through the doorways, and then you've got also a lot of shadow information. Now the combination of the two, if you were to take, this would probably be our best normal exposure. But notice how everything is blown out. You have no detail here. Um, so with HDR, we'll, we'll be able to kind of recover all of that information. So what does that mean for us? Well, for me, it's important to kind of keep things neat. I'm going to drop the thumbnail size a bit so we can see more at one shot. Um, so the first thing I'll typically do before I do anything else when it's a tone map shoot, when I did shooting for HDRs, I'm going to group these. I'm going to stack them. So I'm going to stack them by taking the first nine selections here, and then I'm going to go. I don't normally go through the menu item. I, I have a. I know the shortcut, but if you go to Photo, Stacking, and then Group into Stack, you can see the shortcut is Command G, or it would be Control G on a on a Windows machine, and that takes all nine of those images. It tells me that there are nine images stacked together, and I can kind of see them. So what this is doing is it's telling me that this particular stack, these images will be tone mapped together. Also one thing to note, you see here um, I have this nice little EXIF information. Um, you can customize this. You can customize what appears on your thumbnails in the library mode. And I'll show you how to do that just really quickly. The reason why I do that personally is I like to see the shutter speeds. I see here this is an eighth, a fourth, half, one, two, 4, 8, 15, and 30. And I'm seeing that right here. That's the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. And to do that, just go to View, and then View Options. And then the key here is to make sure under the Show Grid Extras, under the Grid View th uh, um, thumbnail, not thumbnail, tab, uh, make sure you have expanded cells. By default, Compact Cells is selected, but you'll want expanded cells. And then on the bottom here, under the expanded cells extras, I have exposure and ISO selected. I have nothing for the top, for the right. Basically, these four fields. If you were to break this uh, little gray bar at the top here into four quadrants: top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right, you control what appears in them over here. And so I've got exposure and ISO. I've got the file base name, which is just the file name itself, and then the extension on the right. And the reason why I like to see the extension on the right is my particular imaging workflow, um, I know based on the extension of that file, if it's a raw file, if it's a TIFF, or if it's a JPEG, I know um, what the outcome of that file was. If it's a TIFF file, that means that uh, the image has been either processed or is ready for processing. Um, and if it's a JPEG, I know that it has been outputted for publishing on the web. So here. Um, we've got our information. I would go ahead now and I would just kind of start, you know, selecting the images again. And in this case here, I have another, uh, a, a tenth image because I wanted to expose for even more of the highlight information. So I would take all ten of these images, I'd hit Command G, and I have my ten brackets, uh, and repeat the process. And so it's, it's kind of a, a tedious process over here, but um, it's something that if you don't do, you kind of end up with this v huge library of images. And so you can see as I do this, the, the library is getting cleaner, it's getting tighter. Instead of having nine images at a shot, let me just close this right here. Instead of having nine images in a row, I have image one, image two, image three. 
With that said, though, notice how these thumbnails are, are relatively useless. They're really dark. You can't tell, all right, I kind of have an idea of what this is. When you're stacking, watch, you can determine which image appears on the top of your stack, and I'll show you how to do that. I'm gonna select these nine images. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've got these images. Now take a quick second, everyone, and take a look. Notice how this image here is, a, they're all highlighted, except this image here is a little bit brighter than the others. Whichever image is brightest, or super selected as I call it, um, when you stack, that's gonna be the topmost uh, image. So let's say I want this image right here to be the topmost image. All I need to do is click inside of the thumbnail. Doesn't matter how big the thumbnail is, but if I click inside of it, now this one becomes brightest. And if I hit Command G, it's now the top image in the stack. So let's say, oh, well, that's great, Brian, but you already, you know, I already went through and stacked my images and the darkest ones are on top. That's not a problem. All you, can, all you need to do is um, expand your stack and you can do that by hitting the S key, S is in Sam, on your keyboard and S toggles you see how it's expanding and contracting? And then take, you can take the image here, like let's say you want this image. I right click on it, I go to stacking, and I go to move to top of stack. That will take it to the top. So now when I contract it, there's my image. You can also drag and drop too. So I don't necessarily like to do that, but if you want, you can take one of the images and kind of drag it to the front. I don't prefer necessarily doing that. Um, and then one more thing that I do is at the bottom of the library screen, I'll, under the sort, I go to file name. I always like sorting by file name. Let me just go back to the top here. Actually, this is a good example where file name doesn't work, and I can explain why. Um, file name obviously is sequential, and um, because uh, the because uh, the my Canon camera has a four-digit uh, file sequence, every 10,000th shot um, resets the sequence. So at some point during this shoot here, if we scroll down to the bottom, um, I must have reset to 9999, and then uh, I, because I'm sorting by file name, it resets. So this is actually out of order. To keep the shoot in order, I'll go back to capture time. Mm -hmm. So this is actually the order of the shoot. I remember, I remember this was the very first shot as soon as I walked in. I kind of did this head-on shot, um, and then I went so on and so forth. So let's say here that um, I go ahead and I go through and I stack everything. Let's pretend everything's stacked. I'll, I'll stack a few more really quickly um, so we have a good uh, set of stacked images. Uh, la, 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 la. Just bear with me, everyone, because I want to have two rows of stacked images. Oops, I forgot to select these right here. So that one, stacking, move to the top of stack. And one more time there. Uh, that one, stacking, move to top of stack. Cool. And then let's just do one more. So now we'll have two rows of stacked images on the top. So let's pay attention to these top two rows. Let's pretend that our entire catalog here of images has been stacked and it was all neat. The next thing that we need to do is um, is we need to um, uh, rate them. Sorry, I was trying to think of the word. I want to rate these uh, for whether or not I want to um, process them. Let's actually go here and take this one, move to top of stack. So my rating structure is pretty uh, pretty basic. Uh, the f there are multiple passes, I, and by pass I mean I'll go through my images multiple times uh, based on where I am in the rating process. The first thing that I do here is I determine whether I want to uh, work on an image or if I need to delete them mm -hmm. altogether. And so the way I do that is like this. I go into the image here, and let's say I actually want to uh, work on this image or this sequence of images. I'll hit one. One will add one star. One through five adds your star. So one adds one star, two adds two stars, and you can see them down here. Um, for me, for my purposes, one star means, all right, let's work on this. And so then I'll keep going. And you see how it's not showing all nine images? It's only showing the top image. 
So because I went ahead and I stacked first, I can kind of scan through the images quickly. And so I'm going through here and I'm looking at the images and I'm like, all right, you know, this one I want to work on. I don't want to work on this one, but I want to keep it. I don't want to delete it. Uh, this one, uh, yeah, maybe not. Uh, this one looks okay. I want to work on that. I'll give it a one. Uh, this one I don't really care for. Uh, this one I don't care for. This one I don't care for. And then this, so like this one right here. Let's say this one, this is just to me, I never want to touch this. I don't care about it. I don't want to touch it. I'm going to hit X. And X flags it as delete, mark to delete. Means get out of here. You don't need this. Um, uh, and you can see right down here that there's a flag with a, a black flag with an X through it. So if we go back to the grid view, you can see a few things. First, you can see that this image has a one star, this image has a one star, and this image right here has an X. Not only does it have an X, but the thumbnail is grayed out. So when I'm done here, I'll go through um, a second round of ratings. But first, I, what I want to do is I want to remove any rejected images. And again, the rejected images are these X's. So for me, now that I know that this is an X and I see that there's a stack, and I, I know there's a stack because there are nine images, I'm going to click on the stack to expand it. One thing to note is when you reject, uh, so for instance here, the, the image is uh, stacked up. If I hit reject, it only rejects the topmost image, which I don't want. I actually want all of the images to be rejected. So I'm going to select them here. That's the stack. And I'll just hit X. And now all of the images are rejected. And what I can do is I can go to Photo and then Delete Rejected Photos. It's also Command or Control Backspace is the keyboard shortcut. It's going to say, OK, Lightroom sees that you have nine images. What do you want to do? Do you want to remove them or do you want to physically delete them? Removing them is a non-destructive thing. It just removes them from your database. It doesn't, but you keep the files. For me, for instance, I think, you know what, I'll never keep, I'm never going to work on these images. I don't know what I was thinking when I shot it. I'll delete it from the disk. And so it puts them into the trash. So with that done, the next assumption is that I've gone through and I've added my one stars. I've done all of my one star things. Well, now what I can do is I can filter by one stars. Um, I'll go through here. I'll hit S. I'll select all of them and I'll give them one stars. This gives me the opportunity now to see that, all right, under this stack, these are all one star images. The same thing with uh, this shot here. I'll expand them and I'll give them one star. Now, what I can do is I can go to the filter, the library filter right on the top here, and I'm going to go to the attribute. And I'm going to select one star. And I'm going to make sure that it's equal. So you can see here are my images, my nine images. And so it, basically what it's allowing me to do is filter by the images that I want to work on right away. So I'm not wasting time. And I see there are questions about keywords, keywording and metadata. Keywording is one of the, <laughs> it's one of those things that um, it depends on the photographer. Um, I don't shoot stock photography uh, and I no longer do commercial work um, as my, as a profession. So for me, keywording ha is not really critical. Um, however, I understand that keywording is something that a lot of people like uh, to incorporate. And so if you wanted a keyword, uh, and I'll just show it to you just for due diligence here. Um, keywording, uh, there, there are different ways that you can attack keywording. Keywording um, on import or keywording as a whole is usually for me as far as I'll go. So there are a few things here that I know. Um, I'm gonna, you know, all these images um, have the, have a common attribute. So if I select all of these here, and I, all I did was I hit Command A, I can start adding keywords by going to the keywording dropdown. And so I can say here, uh, I can call uh, this uh, urbex. I can say grunge. I can say school. I can say abandoned. <clears throat> I know that this was New York State. I can't remember the city or, or anything like that. But what I'm looking for here, because I have all the images selected, is I'm looking for the most general uh, keyword terms. And so by doing that, I'm going to hit Enter. And it applies those uh, keywords to all the images. I see there's a question, Ryan. What's going on?
Um, th the first thing is um, if you want to try to get access to these places, uh, these kind of abandoned places that are kind of, they, they pose a lot of risks. Um, obviously, you can see in like shots like this one, um, the, 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 the ceiling is caved in and there's a most likely asbestos uh, in, in the areas. Uh, you'll want to make sure that you have uh, liability insurance. And so I use a company called CNA. Um, I can try to find the link at the end of the website or at the end of the webinar. Um, it's a, it, I have a dedicated photographer's insurance policy. So um, not only is all of my gear covered, um, all of my technology is covered, and I have a uh, million dollars in liability. So that means that if any anyone, uh, including myself, um, during the shoot here uh, gets injured or damages something here, uh, I'm covered up to a million dollars. And this is something that a lot of these places won't even listen to you. They won't entertain it. Um, unless you've got that policy. And so um, we reached out to the city. It was in this town. I can't remember the name of the town, and I apologize, but we reached out to their board, and uh, I, I, what I did was I set the town as a co-insurer on my policy. So for the te that temporary amount of time, they were listed as an insured party. Um, and so that helped out. Of course, you can go various other routes where you don't go necessarily the kosher route uh, and obtain permission. Um, you know, that's kind of one of the things about urbex and I'm not condoning it and, you know, on one's official stances do not do anything illegal. But um, there have been times where, yeah, I've gone into places, you know, you kind of just fidget through. Um, in previous webinars that we've done on urban exploration, uh, I always say my golden rule is I will never, I will never, uh, break through anything. I will never rip a door off. I will never break through a window and I will never cut a fence. However, if that stuff has been done already, um, I will, I will kind of exploit that and I will go through the, you know, an open door that I will do, but I will never, nor have I ever, um, nor do I condone, uh, the destruction of property to get access to it. Um, even if it is abandoned, it's not ours and we shouldn't do that. However, I do thank whoever has done it prior. Uh, because it gives me access. So that's kind of a quick segue to this shot here. I will do things like here, uh, just to illustrate for this image. I did take this chalk here. I, put, I arranged this, these papers. I found these papers here. And I did take chalk. The, the surface of this desk was is a chalkboard, which I thought was awesome. And I wrote this little uh, thing here. Um, I didn't mind it because it's uh, it's not permanent. I, can, I was able to wipe it off afterwards. Um, but I thought it really added to the shot. In my opinion, it made the shot. So, um, so that's a little kind of side story. But let's go ahead here. We were talking about keywords. So again, keywords are something that um, really you kind of hit or miss. Um, one thing that is important to bring up though uh, are, is metadata. Uh, so yeah, I, I know with keywording, I don't know if that disappoints people. Um, I definitely have my OCDs, but keywording doesn't fall under that, that uh, craziness. Um, I used to when I was uh, working as a photographer for a living, but now I, I don't really do it. Uh, I just kind of know th what I'm looking for. What is important though, everyone, is your metadata. This is critical. So this is the next step. Um, actually, technically, this is the first step. Um, and I, I apologize, I skipped it. Let's just really quickly again, let's pretend that um, we'll go to file import. Um, and so let's say you're copying. One of the important things here is um, under your, where is it? Where's my metadata? Move or copy as DNG. I thought you could, where's my metadata? Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. There. Um, so again, normally what I was saying was when I finish a shoot, I am copying my images. Um, under the metadata here, under apply during import, there's a drop down that says metadata. And I apologize again that I skipped this but better late than never. Metadata contains information about your image uh, and about you. And it's important that you uh, embed this information into every shot as you import into your library. So what I'll do here is I'll go in and you see here how we have nothing. We have no metadata. What this allows me to do is create a new profile for metadata. So I'm gonna go here to new and I'm gonna create a profile for the year um, 2012 metadata. I do this once a year because nothing changes, for me at least, throughout the year other than the copyright year. So you can see here we have this uh, window, metadata preset window. And I'm just telling you how I do my stuff. 
first thing I'll do here is under the copyright, I'll put the year, 2012, uh, and then um, Brian Matias. Copyright status is copyrighted. Uh, you also have public domain, if you want to do kind of a Creative Commons type of thing where public domain is, is just free. Um, rights, or uh, rights, uh, not Creative Commons. Creative Commons is still under copyright, except it's uh, the rights used to cheer would be Creative Commons with whatever attributes. For me, I have all rights reserved. And then the copyright info URL. So I have on my website, if you just go to just my website, and everyone should have this here. Um, I don't know why I didn't type in .com. Um, under, under the website, I've got a, a thing here called usage. And the first thing you'll notice at the bottom here, all content and images are copyright 2012 Brian Matias. But I do have a, a URL on the uh, breakdown of my copyright. It says, if you'd like to use this yada yada, reach out to me. And so I would take this URL and I'll copy it under the copyright info URL so that if anyone wants to learn more about my usage, I just have it there. The next thing I'll do here is under the IPTC creator, I'll put my name. Um, my address, uh, it depends how you want to do this. Uh, for me, I, uh, I put in my address here. I put in my uh, city, my state, my zip code, uh, the country, phone number. I, I actually created a Google Voice phone number um, so I don't have to put my actual cell phone number. I, I have kind of a, a, a pseudo phone number from Google Voice, which is free. And then, of course, my email address. So in this case here, it's my... Uh, work my old work email when I had my own company, my website, and then job title, whatever, photographer, master of the universe. Um, and so I don't really do anything else here. Uh, the reason why uh, they have all this information is you can actually have metadata presets per job, per shoot. I don't do that. I just kind of everything I do now is, is personal. Uh, or fine art, so I don't really break it down by shoot. Now here's the key thing. The, the key, in my opinion, the most important part of the copyright is right here, or of the uh, metadata is the copyright. I've got my copyright year. This changes every year, so next year it'll be 2013. And then all I'll do is under preset, I'm gonna save this as a new preset, and I'm gonna call it 2012 metadata. So what this allows me to do if I cancel out of here is Let's say I shoot another shoot uh, next week. I can import and then select right there, 2012 metadata. And that will import all the, that information onto my images. Now, you can see here, uh, I already have, because all this, these images, uh, you know, when I imported them into my production volume, I had my copyright. So you can see last year's copyright, 2011, um, my website, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that stuff is there. Um, I just didn't do it on initially. Yo, question. This, the question was, uh, how do we retroactively do it? Well, the first thing I, you, I would do is I would create a new preset. So I'd go under the uh, metadata dropdown in the library. I'd go and I'd create my preset. So let's say you, ha you don't have a preset yet. I would go here and I would add, oops, cancel. I would go ahead and I would create the preset just like we did before. Um, and then I would save that as a new preset. I'd say, um, you know, Joe blog metadata. Create, so I have a new preset there. What I can do is um, I can select all of my images here and then just apply the preset, and that will do it. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to overwrite my information, but um, that's how I would do it. By, by selecting the images and then selecting your preset, it will apply it in batch. You got it, Ryan. I'll get you that information, the insurance information. I, I'll give everyone the company. I, I, it, I'll have to find it because it's. Uh, I know it's CNA, and I don't remember the specific website, etc. Um, now, um, let's go ahead. I see a question here, and it, it allows me to segue by Joan about smart collections. Uh, 
you know, smart objects, they're not smart objects, smart collections. That's a very good question. Um, smart collections are one of my favorite, favorite things in Lightroom. And the reason for that is it's a, it's kind of a, a live, uh, always on folder that will look for specific criteria. So you remember how I said, all right, well, I can filter right here at the top by one star to see everything that I want to work on. Well, the only problem with that is that it, it, it's live. And, you know, it's, I, I would have to go back to my full grid if I wanted to see everything else. Well, what if I can create a new folder that's always watching for certain things? That's where a smart collection comes in, and it's a great question. Under the collections in the library module on the left here, there's a plus sign. I'm going to click it, and I'm going to create smart collection. And I do this, I have about six or seven smart collections that I use, and I'll show you how I work on them. Um, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to name the preset. And so typically here I'm going to say, um, I, what I do is I spell out what it is, what the, what the criteria is, and then uh, what it means. So I would say one star, and then two work on. Now, if you want to keep this as under a set, I, I keep it right on the root, so I have none here. And then you have to specify your criteria. So for me, the criteria is pretty basic. It says rating is, that's the key, not is, then, or greater, or equal to, is one star, create. So right here, under the smart collections, if I bring this out a bit, you can see there is our one star to work on. So it shows only the things that I have. So what does this mean? Well, let's keep your eye on this 18 over here. Let's say I go through, I'm sorting some more, and I'm like, you know what? That's pretty cool. I think I could do something with this. I'd go to my grid, I'd expand it, and I'd select all of the images within that uh, stack, and I'd press 1. Now, all of a sudden, it went from 18 to 27, another 9 images. So now, you can see here what we've got. We've got our images here. Ooh, Andy, I think you got it right. Let me see if that's the website. I'm going to... I want to take a quick second. Andy might have found the, the insurance website that I, that I use. That's the one. Andy, you rock. I'm going to put this out there for everyone right now in the chat module. So in the chat module is the URL. This is the insurance company I use. I find that I've been using them for about three years now. Um, for those of you that may have been on our photo walk two years ago in Vegas when we had Photoshop World, and we shot on the Fremont Street experience. We had full access to tripods and everything. It's because I had this policy and I listed uh, the city of Las Vegas and the Las Vegas Police Department as co-insurers. So they knew that they can claim up to a million dollars in case someone uh, breaks something or someone's dam or someone's hurt. Um, so that insurance policy is really important. Take it or leave it. A lot of people just protect their gear under their renters or their, ho or their home insurance. They have a rider. That's fine too. But um, you're, it, it, again, um, I don't necessarily need it anymore. It was more important when I uh, had my business. Still, it's, uh, I have about uh, maybe twenty-five or $26,000 worth of photography gear alone. Um, and I pay about $600 annually for all that coverage. So if you have less than that, then your monthly, your annual premium will be less. Uh, so just think about that. All right. So um, smart collections. That's how. No, so let's go ahead and let's actually work on an image. It's important. Let's let's work through an entire image. I'm going to go ahead now, and I'm going to let's say here I've got these nine images here, um, and I want to work on them. I'm going to select them, and I'm going to tone map. So I'm going to go to File, Plug and Extras, Export to Photomatix Pro. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a TIFF file, a 16-bit TIFF. Normally in webinars, you'll know that I go to JPEG, but since I'm trying to recreate um, the environment, I'll show you. I do TIFF. Um, I don't need to align. I don't need to reduce any ghosting. The only thing I do here is I reduce chromatic aberration. Now, for those of you that may be asking, this is a, a product called Photomatix uh, by a company called HDR Soft. I'll put it right now in the, um, in the website, in the chat module. And now I'm going to hit, um, and then the, uh, oh, and then one more thing that I do. I was just looking at the chat module. Everyone. 
because I'm sitting from Lightroom, I, I do select automatically re-import into library, Lightroom library. I do not select stack with first selected photo. What, what does that mean? Just so I can be thorough. If I have this selected, let's say I have this selected and I hit export. I'm going to cancel for a second. Let's say while it's doing, while Photomatix is doing its thing, I start working on this image. And so I've got this image selected. If I had that checkbox selected, it would put the tone mapped image right here as opposed to up here. So I don't like that. Uh, and that's why I have it uh, deselected. So I'm going to export. Um, oops. You have to actually select the images again. Um, let's just right click, go to export with uh, Photomatix Pro. Actually, no, file, plugin extras, Photomatix. Um, again, this, and then here's what I do. And this is how I do it at home. Uh, TIFF 16 bit. I have a file naming sequence. I keep the original file name, and then I'll put a dash, and I'll do HDR, and then a letter. This letter here, in this case X, tells me which tone mapping product I used. So um, X means it was Photomatix. Uh, e means that it was HDR Express by uh, Unified Color. Uh, o was, is HDR Effects Pro by Nick. Um, and I think that's all. I, oh, and then P is Photoshop's tone mapping. Because I'll try different things, believe it or not. You know, I find Photomatix to be one of my favorites, so that's what I use. So I know that when I look at this file name, it's an HDR image, it's a TIFF, and it was used, used using Photomatix. I'm going to hit export. I'm going to let uh, the computer do its thing. And we're going to actually tone map the image. So here's the image. It's going to pop up in a second. Perfect. This is looking good. And you can see right off the bat, we get it's a pretty good exposure. We need to fiddle around a little bit. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to look at my histogram. I see that nothing is, uh, I'm not clipping or blowing out uh, shadows or highlights. Uh, I'm going to drop my white point down a bit. I'm going to increase the detail contrast to darken it. And I'm going to drop the gamma just a tiny bit. But this to me is looking good. This is looking as if I was standing in the, uh, in the uh, actually it was a little bit darker. When I was standing there was kind of actually more like, more like that. But because I'm going to post process in a minute, uh, when you're tone mapping, especially uh, if you're stylizing, you want to have the image a little bit brighter than normal because when you stylize, you're going to be darkening a lot to begin with. So now I'm going to hit save and re-import. And watch right there. You saw in the background, here's my image, but the image needs to be stacked correctly. So I'm going to go to my uh, folders. There's the image. It's it's um, not stacked. You see here how it's it's next to it because we are sorting by capture time, but um, we want to stack. So all I need to do here is select this, shift, and select my stack, and then again, photo, stacking, group into stack, and now I have ten images with the tone mapped image. And you can see, you remember how I said that's why I like to have the base file name. I see here it's a, a Photomatix HDR. It's a TIFF file. Now what do we do? Well, the first thing I do when I tone map an image is I change this rating to 2. No, and notice how it only changes that to 2. Not the whole, not all the brackets, just this. What does that mean as well? Well, that means I can create a new collection, a new smart collection. 2 star uh, HDR to process. Again, rating is two stars. Create. I should only have, um, oh, I must have, okay, let's take that away. There we go. There's my one image. There's my tone mapped image. Now I'm going to go, I'm going to send it to the suite by going to File, Plugin Extras, Perfect Photo Suite. It's going to create a PSD copy of the image automatically. And I'm going to go to Perfect Effects. And I'm just going to do a quick job here. I'm not going to spend too much time. But I'll go here, I'll probably right off the bat, something like um, Movie Looks Urban Sickness will give me exactly what I want for this image. I'm going to drop down the strength. I'm going to hit Add. And then I'm going to add something probably like Grunge Goddess. Actually, just enough darkness would be good too. Just enough darkness will be good. Again, drop that down because it's desaturated a bit. 
And then the last thing I'm going to do is add a slight tonal contrast. Again, I say slight because when it comes in, it comes in 100%. And I'm going to drop that down. Uh, I'm going to drop the brightness down. Wait a second. Why, why wasn't, was I not hitting add? I must not have been hitting add. Huh. Let me go to here. Do that again. Urban sickness. Drop that down. Hit add. Oh, I must not have hit add. Sorry about that. I was wondering why things weren't changing. Then just enough darkness. Uh, there we go. There we go. Now we're getting there. All right, drop that down. And then hit add. Uh, and then go to color and tone. Tonal contrast. Drop that down. And so we can see here the before and the after. Uh, in perfect effects, to toggle bef between the before and the after, uh, just hit um, Command P on the Mac or Control P. So here's our before, here's our after. Um, and then I'm going to hit Apply. So what is happening is perfect effects is uh, uh, committing those effects and returning back to perfect layers. You can see right here. I'm going to hit save um, in perfect uh, photo suite updates the PSD file so that when I go into Lightroom, there's my new image. Now, the new image, when it comes in, uh, Lightroom essentially creates a copy with the, the same uh, rating system. So guess what? What does this mean? Well, now this means a third folder. Create smart collection. Smart collection, this is going to be three star. Uh, HDR ready to publish. There, rating is a three. Notice how we have nothing in there because we haven't marked anything, but I can go to this HDR, go to here, press three, and now it removes it from the two star folder, but it puts it into the three star folder. And so here's my image. Now, there are a few things I'm going to do here before I output uh, to uh, uh, to the web. I'm going to go to the develop module, and this I'll, I'll do typically a lot. I'll do my stylizations. Uh, in this case here, uh, I'll go ahead and I'm going to bring up the contrast a little bit, and I'm going to bring up the global clarity uh, of the image. I also like to drop saturation a bit and boost uh, vibrance in equal amounts because I think it does a nice job of kind of uh, boosting, I guess, the right colors, if as it were. Um, and then I'll also, uh, in this case here, drop the highlights a tiny bit because it's a bit hot over there. And I'm going to drop the darks. So I'm basically what I'm doing is I'm shifting the, uh, the, the luminance of the histogram. Um, and that's actually showing the clipped shadows. The, if you hover over these areas here, you'll see anything that's clipped uh, and anything that's um, blown out. Now, man oh man, clipped shadows I don't mind so much because, yeah, the, this information, all, that, all the stuff that's popping up blue, doesn't matter. But an HDR image, look at that. For the amount of tonal range, there is n almost nothing that's blown out in terms of the highlights. We, just a little bit over here, and there was a little bit on that strip. But for the most part, we've got so much tonal range. It's, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. Um, so uh, the other thing I might do here is uh, add a tiny a little bit of a post-crop vignette. This image was taken with my Canon 17 millimeter tilt shift lens, so that's why I don't really need to do too much correction. I might rotate it just a tiny bit to get my uh, the keystoning correct. There we go. So this is looking like a proper square, and uh, and I'm happy. So let's say I go ahead now and I've I've uh, processed this image. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. I'm going to create a new export preset. It's time to export for the web. To do that, I'm going to go to File, Export. And here's what we're going to do. The first thing we'll do is export to hard drive. We're exporting to a file on your hard drive. And I'm going to select um, Export to Desktop. Here, you can specify a specific folder. For me, I'm going to say put it in a subfolder called um, Published. Now, why do I do this? Well, I register my images uh, with the US Copyright Office. And 
it's important that you try to register um, as quickly as possible before you publish. So I know that if I put an image up here, the image has been uh, registered already and I know that it's been published, so I can prove that. So I put the image in a published subfolder. Um, I'm gonna hit rename to uh, the file here. Uh, do I do anything here? I don't, I don't rename the file. I keep the file the same. What I do is I format, I change the format from TIFF to JPEG. Uh, the quality I leave at 100. I keep the color space at sRGB because sRGB is the most common uh, color space for the web. You can do Profoto or Adobe, it's up to you. Um, I resize for the web uh, to, and I do, I select the long edge and I say that the long edge should never be longer than uh, 1,000 pixels at 120 pixels per inch. I find this to be a perfect resolution. It's, it's large enough that it'll look good on any web page, but it's small enough that if anyone were to take a copy of it, they really couldn't do too much um, with it in terms of enlarging it. I'm also gonna output, use, I, I, I use Lightroom's sharpening for output. When I'm sharpening the image uh, normally, I use the sharpening in perfect resize, but when I'm just outputting for the web, I, sh I sharpen for screen using the standard. You can use high or low. I find high to be too much and I find low not to do much at all. Um, you can also, if you were printing on um, printer paper, matte or glossy, you can specify sharpening for that. But because I'm sharpening for your screen, I'm gonna do that. Uh, I don't minimize the metadata and I, uh, I also write, write the keywords uh, that I have, but this is also moot because uh, I don't use keywords. I also don't believe in, in uh, watermarking images. Um, I just don't, I never was a fan of that. And so I don't watermark. However, you can use Lightroom's watermarking. And so with that, uh, when you're done, just hit add on the bottom left here. And you can say that this is, um, uh, blah, 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 what was this? This was, um, oh, uh, export uh, for web under user preset. So I'm gonna create that. So now I can always go ahead and just, use, instead of going through all this, this is a snapshot of those settings. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan just asked if I was getting the questions he was sending. Yeah, but I wasn't looking. I'll go over my copyright thing in a minute. I knew that was gonna, <laughs> copyright is, a, copyright? Uh, printing and uh, backup. Those are the three topics that whenever someone mentions them on the webinars, people go crazy. I w they w and I love it, so I will go over it. Um, so when I'm done here, I'll hit export. Where'd my cursor go? There it is. Now if I hide the Lightroom for a second, there's our published folder right here, and in it is our image. There's our thousand pixel image. Perfect for the web. Um, if you want, I know some people do this, um, you can go back into that export preset. So if we go to file export, <coughs> under the file renaming, sometimes people will actually edit the file name. They'll say edit, uh, and then th at the end they might do something like Brian Matias, or the, you know, you'll know, you put your name. So that it'll always take the original file name and add a dash name. So you can do that as well. If that's what you wanna do, make sure that when you're done, Give me one second, Ryan. When you're done, right click on that uh, preset and update with current settings. That will update uh, the information. Go ahead, Ryan. Good question, uh, and it's uh, again neurosis. Uh, I did. Uh, I've always done it 120 because um, <coughs> for the web, only because I find that uh, to me that's an, more of an optimal. I was actually having this conversation with Matt Kloskowski uh, from NAPP a little while ago. Um, I give a lot of my images away for uh, like uh, iPad and iPhone users. Uh, so that you can use them as backdrops and stuff. And uh, when we were looking at it, uh, at 120 pixels per inch was like a nice, um, 
it's not quite 300 pixels per inch, which is good for print. 72 is good for display. Um, but I find 120, if I'm giving my images away or if I'm putting them on the web, uh, having a little bit of a higher uh, pixel density count uh, for me seems like it's worth it. Um, I wouldn't put it at 300 pixels per inch. Um, so no good, no scientific, in my opinion, uh, answer. I could, you could do 72, 72 is your kind of uh, standard, but I find 120 to be uh, a happy little uh, bo boost in uh, quality. And again, at 1,000 pixels, it's not really, um, basically what you're doing is you're just kind of increasing the pixel density um, per the maximum uh, uh, resolution that you have specified here. So yeah, that that's that's really it. I hope it kind of is is satisfactory. Uh, I've been doing it for I don't know how long. That this literally is um, my export preset minus the dash Brian Matias. I don't really put that in there. Um, I'm not really worried about it. You know what I mean? Uh, if someone wants to steal my shot, they're gonna steal it. Um, I just put it out there. That's why I register. Go ahead, steal it. Um, so we've now uh, outputted. We have a file on our desktop here. It's ready to go. So what does that mean? Well, this image in the grid, it says here HDR ready to publish, is no longer ready to publish. In fact, it's been published. So what I do is I go to, uh, uh, I go to the collections and I create a, another smart collection and I call this four star. And I call it uh, HDR uh, published. Rating is four stars. I hit create. I go back to that image and I just hit four. So I know that this image um, has been published on the web. It's not ready to publish. It's not pro ready to process. Oh, actually, no. This, this actually allows me to circle back. When I have an image that's published uh, and when I have an image that's ready to publish, I always go back to the to process and I hit zero. Zero removes all stars. The image is done. So I, don't, I no longer need it. And so you can see here, I'm going to just move this to the top of the stack. We have our nice sequence of events. We have our nine brackets, you know, up here. Then we have the tone mapped image. See, I mean, look at the difference between the two. It's, I mean, who can argue that HDR is bad when it's done right? And then we have the stylized image. So we've got all of that there. And when I drop the stack, I have my top image right over here, 11 images. And this, typically, this is my stack count for HDR. My nine, my nine brackets, my one tone mapped, my one final. Um, now, registering. OK, so let's talk about registering. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of uh, copyright registration. Um, one, because we've got uh, it's this is a global audience, and not uh, not you know, the like Patty. I believe Patty is in New Zealand, if I remember correctly. Uh, sh she wouldn't really be filing with the U.S. Copyright Office. Um, I don't know what what the laws are external, but long story short, um, you can just do a simple search for the U.S. Copyright Office. Um, and make sure, make sure that it's copyright.gov if you're in the U.S. and not copyright.com. Go to copyright.gov to go to the USCO, uh, which is the U.S. Copyright Office. Um, I can recommend um, a book that was actually just given to me yesterday. It's by uh, our friend Jack Resnicki. Let me go to Amazon.com. And, and the reason why I'm recommending it is because I was browsing through it, and he actually goes through step-by-step uh, step with pictures through this website of what to do. But I'll, I'll show you what I do. I'll show you what I do. Um, it's Jack uh, Riznicki, I think, if I could spell that right. This is it right here. And I'll put the URL, the Photographer's Survival Manual. Um, and the, it's going, the URL is going in the chat module right now. And this will allow you, this kind of walks through. Um, it's actually good. It's getting good reviews. Um, and it was published in uh, 2010, so the uh, information should be relevant. Um, and you'll want to go to this, how to register a work, ECO login. Now, um, what do I do here? Well, you have to submit images for, um, for uh, 
uh, copyright. You have to upload the images or you can mail them. So what I do is um, I don't wait till the image is stylized because I can come to this image in a year from now. I took this image in August on August 11th of 2011. And just the other day, I was working on one of these images. So what does that mean? I'm going to wait until I publish an image? No. What I do is this. I go ahead and um, I stack everything, just like I did. I would go ahead and I'd stack all of these images. So let's pretend that these first two rows, this is the entire shoot. The first thing I do is I create an export uh, plugin, just like before. I go to File, Export. Because what I have to do is I have to get my images in, to, uh, re in a ready state to upload to the uh, US Copyright Office. So what I'll do here is I create, I, I put it under a folder called uh, To Register. I go to my custom settings here and I do uh, customize my settings here. And uh, I st this to me is where it's important first. I do Brian Matias and then I do the uh, file name because my file name has the date, 2011, and then the file name. So this is good for me. I do done. Oh, and then I save it. You can actually save presets for file names. I go to the preset, I go to save current preset, and I say uh, copyright file name. And I hit create. So now I have that preset ready to go. I hit done. So let's walk through it. We're exporting images to the desktop under a subfolder called to register. I'm renaming the images to Brian Matias dash file name. JPEG, sRGB, 800 pixels. Is 800 pixels is more than large enough to prove it's your image. I also, in this case, do 72 DPI, or PPI rather. And uh, the reason why I do that is because I want the images to be, um, I want them to be discernible, but I don't necessarily want to bloat them. By adding from 72 to 120 PPI, you are increasing file space. And when you upload to the Copyright Office, you have a 60-minute window to upload. So you want to you want to be efficient. Then I'm going to uh, sharpen for screen. I do everything else here, and now I'm going to create a new preset called um, register or copyright registration export. So there's my copyright registration export. What I can do is I can take these eight images, just the eight, just the top images. This is again why it's important that in your stacks you don't have a dark image as your top, because it's not identifiable. All eight of these images, when you look at them, they're identifiable. You right click, you go to export, and you go to the copyright registration. So what does that do? On the top right here, exporting only eight images. If I hide, there's my two register, and I open it. And there are my eight images with the file name. So there, 800 pixels. Next, what I'll do is I will take all of the images and I'm going to compress them. So Mac or Windows, you have built-in compression. Compress them. And then I'll say um, uh, Brian Matias and then the shoot. So it was uh, 2011, 08, 11, uh, you know, Urbex school, whatever the case may be. And this is what gets uploaded to the Copyright Office. The Copyright Office accepts zip files. And it accepts within zip files. If you read that book, um, it'll accept PSDs, uh, TIFFs, JPEGs. Um, so uh, go through and, and figure out. But by giving JPEGs, you're, you're you know pretty much guaranteeing that you're OK. And so with that, um, that's I'll update that. And I'll usually wait uh, for the confirmation. It doesn't take too It's actually significantly quicker if you upload versus um, if you mail in your DVD or disk of, of uh, images. Uh, and I'll wait to get confirmation that the copyright registration was successful, meaning it was approved. I don't wait to get the certificate in my hands. You'll get, a, you'll get an email sooner, but you will get a certificate in the mail. Um, and at that point, I'll start publishing. So when I'm in here, um, when I have an image that's ready to publish, if it goes, uh, if it's in the ready to publish, that means that it's been uh, registered. So I don't mind putting something on the web. Uh, I know people are going to start asking, well, what about all the thousands of images that I've already put up there? You can still get protection for copyright, but um, you definitely 
do minimize uh, your um, uh, punitive damages that you can ask for. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I, I know that um, that is the case. Uh, published work, uh, because it's been put out there, um, is not, you don't have as strong of a case as if this is an unpublished work. Um, so if, you un if it's unpublished, meaning no one's ever seen it, you register it, then you publish it. Now you have the full protection of your copyright. So um, the book there is a really good resource. Is there a charge? Absolutely, Stephen. Um, it's, uh, I think, 35 US dollars per uh, filing. So it's, uh, it's 35 bucks, and I believe you can just pay with a credit card. Why not register the HDR and stylized plus any unpublished? Because Steve, um, uh, the HDR, the so what Steve is asking is this: um, Why not register these three images? Um, or you know, this may not be the best example. Maybe maybe this one here would be the best example. So why not register this one, that one, and that one? The reason is because um, one, I don't need to. Uh, this image will prove that. Um, I, this is my image, especially when you look at this one and that one. Um, I don't, because I have all rights reserved and I'm not Creative Commons where I allow for derivatives, this could be considered a derivative. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, I don't allow for it. Um, it's my image, uh, you know, depending on who wants to use it. If it's a nonprofit, I usually don't, I, I let that usually go for, um, for nothing. Um, but if it's a, a commercial work, Absolutely, and you know, if there's an advertising budget, I, I, won't, I feel I should be compensated um, at whatever worth I have set for myself. So uh, it, it really depends. Now, again, I'm not foolish. When I put my images on my blog um, or on Google Plus or on Facebook, look, there are sub. If you're on the internet, just assume that privacy and, and that kind of stuff is open for grabs. Um, doing that will, one, it'll give you a little bit of a, you know, a cynical peace of mind, but two, it'll also, you know, uh, you know, you, if it's important to you, if you know that, if I know that this image is important to me and I'm putting it out there on the internet for public consumption, I'm either going to take the necessary steps to protect myself or I'm not. That's just the way it is. And if someone's going to do something, they're going to do it or they're not. If they're going to take it, they're going to take it. If not, they're not. However, if they do take it and I catch it and it's in a commercial environment, um, I have a leg to stand on. So it's kind of a you know cynical type of way of looking at it, but my priority is uh, to, to share images. I think the only bad image is the one that's not shared. And so get that get it out there to people. I love educating people. I'm giving you everything I know about my photography. Um, I'm not worried that someone's going to oust me or, or you know, whatever. Go ahead. Get out there. Do what you need to do um, to get the images. I'll, I'll be happy uh, if you are able to get out there and, um, and make a good image for yourself. To me, that's, that's my reward. Um, I get compensated very nicely, and I get tons of fun perks at On One, so I'm not worried about it. Um, it, it, it opens the doors. Being the, the having the role that I have here opens the doors for me to share everything that I know about photography uh, with all of you, because um, that's the name of the game. Photography, people will make their money on it, uh, however they need to. Um, that much I don't know how much I can help you with, but uh, I, I will be always willing to help you get the best possible shots. So, Ryan, what do we got? What do we have for, um, I don't do D Digimark, Steve. Steven's asking if I use Digimark, um, which is kind of a, uh, it's a pay for service uh, that will uh, invisibly and electronically embed uh, kind of a trace key on your image. I don't use that. Again, um, there's some s amazing tools like uh, the Google's reverse image and, and like, uh, I think it's called TinEye. Um, is it TinEye? Yeah, ten eyes are reverse image search. So like you can put, you can actually. There's some. There are some amazing thing, ways. Like I can upload an image and see where it's being used. Let's just see that. Let's go to choose file, um, published, and let's see if this image here is being used anywhere. Okay, good. 
searched over two billion images. Um, so there are two re ways, reasons why I didn't find this, because this image is published. And the only reason why I can think of is because the published version is processed slightly differently, so it doesn't have the same look. However, we've used this um, uh, many times. My friends have used it, my colleagues have used it, and it works very well. And Google has their own uh, uh, reverse search engine as well for images, so uh, it's pretty fun to, to use, and it's free. The t oh, so Steve is talking about the timing of the unpublished versus published. I think you have, uh, oh, I can't remember, is it 90 days? You have 90 days from the time that I publish. So let's say I publish this. And again, I, I, I think if I publish this image here on my blog without registering it, I believe I have 90 days to retroactively submit re uh, request to, to um, register for copyright and have the protection. How do I find a file that I took two years ago if I don't remember the date, uh, GG? Um, I've never had that problem. Uh, it's definitely, yeah, I have, um, I average about uh, 25 to 30,000 exposures uh, a year, sometimes more uh, because of how many brackets I take. And so uh, I kind of have an idea. I, I remember where I was. I have a general inclination. It may take a, a minute or two of searching through a few catalogs not really, never really phased me. For portrait shoot, uh, what would you register them first? Um, I don't do portrait shooting, Bonnie. Um, but when I was doing um, commercial work, like I did, a, I did a, like restaurants and hotels, and uh, and like small businesses, the the, the kind of like real estate work. Um, my uh, contracts always stated that I retain the copyright, I own the copyright, I'm responsible for registering the copyright. So um, that was never really an issue because I wasn't the one publishing the images. The images were being given, they were uh, licensing them from me, so I controlled all that. What's the maximum number of files a Lightroom catalog can handle? Vince, it's a good question. I don't have a hard number. I know that with Lightroom 1 and Lightroom 2, um, it was really poor at handling large amounts of files, and that's kind of where my whole breaking down into multiple catalogs came uh, to be, uh, because I used Lightroom since the pre-1 beta days. Um, with Lightroom 3, Adobe really improved their cataloging database technology, so you can get away with putting tens of thousands of images in a single catalog. That's up to you. For me, again, it's, it, it's not really a big deal for me to go here and have, you know, um, year, first half and kind of know that within the first half I have January through June. Not a big deal. Um, oh, apparently Stephen says that the maximum is 256,000 images, which is plausible. Uh, Donald's asking, how many images can you register in a zip, single zip file? Um, this uh, The $35 fee, first of all, is not for a zip file. It's just for that 60-minute time frame. Um, you, in, in, based on uh, the, f the resolution, and it was in the book, you can have several hundreds of images in any one zip file. Uh, and you can upload multiple zip. So within the hour, you can upload multiple zip files. So you can keep uploading. Ah, backup. Colleen, thank you. Let's, let's, um, let's do backups, um, my backup strategy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I apologize. I would have... Uh, I would have left without that. My backup strategy for me is, is proprietary. It's how it's my own way of doing it. Um, uh, si actually, it's similar here. Um, and I can actually probably, you know what? I can connect to my home uh, computer right now. I'm in the office in my studio. So here's my computer, Skynet SSD. And um, let's actually take a look at, I don't know how fast it'll go. With, uh, with, there we go. All right, so this is perfect. My home computer, um, the backup strategy is, is several folds. First, um, I use Time Machine. I, I use Macs at home, so Time Machine is a built-in um, uh, backup solution that Apple has. And Time Machine only backs up my system drive. So just like here, um, if I open up a new window, on this particular computer, um, we've got uh, the data drive, 
and we've got our system drive. And on the system drive, I've got all of my applications, I've got some files, and I've got my user preferences. My time machine backs up all of this stuff. It backs up only this stuff and nothing else. At home, I have a volume called um, Bokeh. And Bokeh is um, my, uh, it's, a, it's a Drobo, I use a Drobo S at home, a five bay uh, rated hard drive. That's my production volume. That's where all of my work is done, and it connects to my Mac Pro using an eSATA uh, bus. Um, with that, if you look under here, just to kind of prove I have all of my images, the, this is my master photo library. These are where the actual um, images live. So 2011, look at that. I mean, I practice what I preach, 2010, January through 2012. So all of my images, if I go into any one folder, I'll have the shoots. Um, and then I will also have a separate folder, just like before, my Lightroom catalogs. And here are my catalogs. And so uh, 2012, my first half. In 2011, I was doing it by quarter. And in, it was in Q3 that I decided to do uh, a full half year. So in 2010, Q1, Q2, Q, these are all separate Lightroom catalogs. So in 2011, or 2012, I've got my first half. So what does that mean? Well, I use a program called ChronoSync, and I've got it on this computer here. Uh, if I go to the ChronoSync application, and I'll, I'll walk you through building this out really quickly. What ChronoSync is great at is it allows you to specify a, um, a specific folder, and it specifies where to put that folder. So what does this mean? Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and create a, a backup for my Lightroom catalog folder. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take my Lightroom catalog folder. That's the source. And where do I want it? Well, um, if we go to, let me just show the icons on the desktop for it. Normally I like to hide my icons, hard disks and external hard disks. There we go. So I want to put um, my Lightroom catalogs, let's say under the webinar backup hard drive. I'm going to create a folder, oops, webinar backup. I'm going to create a folder here called Lightroom Catalogs. And I'm going to drag that folder here. So what is this saying? It's saying take the files, all the files and all the folders in Lightroom Catalogs, back up from left to right to the hard drive. And I synchronize deletions. And when I find a file that I want to delete, move it to the trash. Because if I delete something, if I if I delete something here, I want to delete it in my backup. That's just kind of how I work. I've never had a problem with this. Some people are like, well, in case I accidentally delete something, that's fine too. I've I've done this since '97, um, as you can see. Um, I've been doing my this for a long time, and so uh, once I'm done here, um, I can schedule it. So the first thing you want to do is save this backup. So this is a backup file. We'll call this um, LR Catalog backup. Uh, we'll save it to the desktop so you can see the file. So th this is a ChronoSync backup file. And now I can schedule this. And so the way I schedule my backups is I have uh, daily at 1 a.m. So at 1 a.m. every single day, this backup is going to run. It's going to backup and it's going to incremental, it's going to be an incremental backup. So only changes will be backed up. The first backup you do will be the longest because it has to back up everything. So that's my backup for my uh, Lightroom catalogs. The other backup, I'm going to hit new to create a new backup document. Same thing. Uh, let's, uh, let's create, let's open up a new folder and go back to my, um, my home computer for a second. We'll go back here. And then now the most important one, by far, my master photo library. That will be my source. And over here, my destination, master photo library on the backup folder. There we go. And uh, save that. And we'll call this uh, master photo library backup. So now I have my photo library backup file right up here. And um, I schedule this at um, daily at, uh, th I think it's three in the morning. Cause I give two, uh, the Lightroom catalogs don't typically change that much. So I don't really, I, uh, from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. is typically enough time. 
and I'll hit OK. So you can see over here um, under my document manager, uh, I've got the this stuff scheduled to go. Um, oh, and I also synchronized deletions. Um, so that's my on-site. On-site means every night at home, my Drobo is being backed up to two separate hard drives because I have one hard drive for my catalogs and one hard drive for my... Uh... Oh, no, no, I have... I'm sorry, I, don't, I used to do that. I actually have two physical hard drives at home that have backups, so I have redundant backups because I'm uh, absolutely insane. What I also have is I have this drive. I have an off-site solution, so I'm going to go to Amazon. I'm going to show you this drive. It's a GTEC 4 terabyte RAID. It's kind of pricey. I've got it right here. I'll put the link in. Um, and so what I do is I bring this home every two weeks without fail. Every two Fridays, I bring it home, um, and I have a separate backup here, a Chronosync backup, that backs up everything. Um, uh, it updates everything. So every two weeks, uh, the offsite backup is updated, and I bring it um, to the office here. So I know that if my house blows up at on one, I've got the stuff. And so you can actually see that. Um, oh, actually, it's uh, right here on my webinar. Or Give me one second. My... There it is. This is my lap, my work laptop that's on my desk, and there is my G-RAID. And you can see on my G-RAID, um, it has every, every, it's actually just taking a little bit to load, but um, it's going to launch uh, and show you every folder that I've ever taken. Now, I don't know why it's taking so long unless the computer is asleep, but uh, I want to wait for it. I'll let it go. So that's kind of what I do is I know that every two weeks um, I have uh, a full copy of my entire photo library um, somewhere other than my house. The office is secure, um, and uh, it's as good of a place as any. Um, when I worked from home, when I was with On One, I originally worked from home for a year, I would actually give the hard drive to a, my friend, who is also a photographer in Boston. We exchanged hard drives. So he had a hard drive of mine at his place, and I had a hard drive in case you don't have an office. We were both working from home, so um, we both understood the need for off-site backup. Uh, Chronosync is a Mac-only product, so I can't quit out here. I don't know why it's canceling or it's f failing. I've never had an issue with my Chronosync. So um, that's kind of the w what my backup strategy is. Are there any questions? Oh, I, before we do that, actually, um, I'm going to address two things. First. I see a few people asking about online backup services. Absolutely, positively not. Not for me. Never was. Um, you know, things like Mosey or uh, Carbonite or any of these other junks. F for me, um, uh, I don't know how big my shoots are. The shoots can be, the the, the images uh, can be massive. So um, to update, uh, you know, all these gigabytes of images would take uh, days. Secondly, um, who am I to say that Mosey is going to be in business uh, a year from now? Who, who, who's to say? Um, I know that I'm going to have my hard drives. Um, I have, uh, you know, several backup solutions in terms of several hard drives. So if one fails, I, I have redundancy. But I know that I've got my hard drives. So, um, and it's off-site. So for me, it's just kind of, I, I don't trust uh, that this company is going to be in business. Uh, and so it's never really a solution for me. Um, in terms of RAM, Vince, uh, I have 16 gigs of RAM, both on this computer here uh, and, oops, not that, and uh, on my home, my Mac Pro at home, I, I use 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, RAM is relatively cheap um, these days. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of what I do. Uh, Ryan just left. I guess, we're, what, how long are we going? Ooh, an hour and a half. Nice. Um, I'm just scanning through some of the questions. Are there... <laughs> Steven's saying that he, he'd call my backup solution constructively paranoid. Absolutely, Steven. Absolutely. Um, uh, it, it, it's paranoid, not so much like uh, conspiracy or anything like that. 
my images are everything. There's only been, there's only been one time in my life when I f lost images. They were gone um, from a shoot. Um, and it was a really important shoot for me. It was a personal shoot, thankfully, but the images were gone. And so um, uh, it's something that I never, and I remember uh, it's like losing a loved one in a way. You know, you're so invested emotionally in your images. You don't want to lose them. So with that, um, I don't think we're ending the session. Um, I'm not, I didn't end the session, so uh, I'm hoping that the webinar doesn't end on you guys. But, um, oh wait, Gordon, Gordon's saying, let me see this. Um, Gordon says the Supreme Court recently ruled that you, the U.S. will honor all nations' copyrights. That's good. I just lost a whole wedding shoot done two years ago on an online backup system. So Linda's saying that uh, she lost a, a wedding shoot, an entire shoot that was on an online backup system. So yeah. Oh, the session ended, but people came back on? That's weird. Oh, I wonder if it's because Ryan, so Ryan uh, Ryan was an admin, and so he had to leave, and so he, he probably shut down his webinar thing. Ah, huh, interesting. Do, uh, do I not believe in DVD backups? That's a great question, Stephen. No, I don't. Um, uh, DVD, this optical media, they degrade over time. Hard drives do as well, but um, I don't even, uh, I don't have optical drives anymore. <clears throat> in my laptop, I replaced the optical drive with a solid state drive. Um, and, and, and a hard drive, so I have two hard drives in my laptop. Um, my Mac Pro, which is a 2009 Mac Pro, the optical drive died, and so I never bothered replacing it. The iMac here has a optical drive, but I don't know why. So yeah, I don't necessarily care for it. And David, David makes a good point, and I agree with him 100%. David's comment says, I think the most important thing in your backup system is the fact that you're actually using an on-site and off-site backup. You're 100% right. Um, the cloud is all well and good for like your contacts and your calendar and your to-do list and some basic documents like Dropbox. Great. I love Dropbox. I live by, you can see the little Dropbox icon right up here. I pay for the premium Dropbox. I've got you know my 57 gigs of space. Um, but it's not where I'm going to put my images. No way, Jose. Uh, my images will stick on um, on the hard drives that I have control over. So that's kind of how it is. Um, portable flash drives. Like uh, Sumaya, you're talking about like um, like a thumb drive, or are you talking about like a like a an SSD drive? Uh, flash drives are good, but uh, Bernard's, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, flat, the, the only thing with flash drives is that they're relatively small in space and the larger ones are very expensive. So for me still, hard drives offer the best uh, compromise of space versus cost. Uh, even with the recent Thailand floodings where drives have kind of gotten more expensive. If you notice, you don't see very many deals on drives anymore, or at least lately. Um, oh, and a UPS. Yes, I do have a UPS. Steven, thank you. Um, I'll show you the UPS. That I can't remember it. It's um, Amazon.com. And uh, uh, what is it? Let's just do UPS. It's a, oh, this is the one I have, I think. This one right here. I have actually two of the, I have two, two of the, yeah, this is the one I have because I bought it. Uh, um, and I, the reason why I have two of them is um, because one of them powers my Mac Pro and and a, a display, one of my 30 inches, and then the other one powers my Drobo and my uh, other 30 inch display and the external hard drives. I don't want to overcook one of the UPSs. I don't want it to draw that much power. And the Mac Pro pulls in a ton of energy, so. How does Photoshop fit in my workflow? That's a good question, Terry. Um, usually I'll take an image here, and in all honesty, um, I would send it to Photoshop. 
and uh, I would work. I would still go to Perfect Effects. I would just do it through Photoshop first. Uh, where's my image? That's weird. That is weird. Let me try that again. Edit in Photoshop. Not sure why Photoshop isn't working for me. Oops. Let's pretend it did work. Well, I would work in Photoshop over here, and then I would send it back because I do a lot of adjustment layers. So. Will the webinar be posted? You, you betcha, Frank, definitely. It'll, it'll be posted today, actually. I'm going to edit it down once I'm done with it. Is there, oh, so, uh, uh, Mayor's asking if there's an equivalent to Chronosync on Windows 7. So to all my Windows users out there, can you um, guys recommend uh, backup applications that are similar to Chronosync? And I will um, post it out there for Mayor and other people. Uh, Andrew's asking if I've done anything with my old negatives or my analog film. Um, I just send it out to, um, to uh, Scan Cafe in those situations because I don't have a film scanner. I think it was, yeah, it's scancafe.com. And they do a really great job of, uh, you can send them your film and um, they'll scan it for you. All right, so we've got, um, I'll, I'm gonna type a few out here in the chat module. So uh, Francois is saying Nova backup. Then there's uh, Roxio, Roxio is a great company, Retros Ro Roxio Retrospect um, by Steven. Good Sync by John and uh, Sync Toy. I heard Sync Toy actually, uh, which is Microsoft. I've heard of that by Carm. John saying, "Oh, and Francois is giving me the URL." Thank you, Francois. Merci. Um, when you quit Lightroom, do you get Lightroom? Do you let Lightroom do the backup? No, Charles, I don't. I don't. Uh, Charles is asking if I let Lightroom. I, I covered that at the beginning. I Under the catalog settings, I turn off under general I, a backup catalog never because Chronosync is doing it for me. What are my, essential, my favorite essential add-ins for Lightroom? Well, obviously the perfect photo suite. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was probably uh, instant, right? Um, perfect photo suite. Um, is definitely one of my critical ones. I don't know if you uh, guys and gals know this, but we actually give away free uh, Lightroom presets. So if you go to the On One website and you go to products, and I'll give you, I'll put the URL, and then we go to uh, free products. We have actually free uh, Photoshop plugins, um, and in here the presets for Lightroom. So I'll put that right here. So I use those sometimes if I'm looking for just a quick and dirty update. So how do you um, relocate files directly? As oh, I use Lightroom. Uh, so Carm's asking here um, with Lightroom, how do I relocate? Let's say I had, uh, I would actually use, I'd create a new folder um, and I'd uh, use the grid module and I'd drag over because that way the, li the Lightroom um, library manager is managing the, the move. I don't do it in the finder. Are the presets included in the perfect photo suite? No, Dave, they're, they're, they're different ones than what you'd find. Francois is also saying that there's another, he, Francois is giving me another free backup. It's called uh, Colby and backup and I'm putting the URL right here as well. See, so why, why I love doing these webinars. I don't use the film strip. David's saying that he sees I don't use the film strip, which is right down here. I can't stand it. Uh, to me, it's just, it's, and again, just personally, it's too distracting having my images here and having them all here. Even if I'm in a, a uh, the loop view, it's just too, way too distracting. And, and uh, when I'm working on my images, I, I like to minimize. In fact, I typically have uh, this panel closed out 
in the, in the library module, I'll have the right panel closed, and in the develop module, I'm going to have the um, left panel closed because I don't use presets all too often. I uh, I use the sliders here all the time, and so it extends the um, the uh, the real estate of the screen. And I also like to have dark gray. If you right click in this area, um, the default for uh, Lightroom is medium gray, but to me that's too much of a contrast, and I don't like it. It's it's distracting. Same thing with black. I don't like black so much. I find dark gray to be perfect, where I can focus on the image. Oh, Des is asking an interesting question. I think someone else asked this similarly, as to whether or not I first copy my images um, locally to the hard drive. No, I, I have a Firewire, uh, or you, it doesn't matter, Firewire or USB, uh, card reader. So I'll take the card out of the camera and I'll connect it to the reader and I'll import off the card. I don't copy it over. 